death for you. Is, is just, you know, has just done all kinds of things to the city. And I'm not completely convinced, you know, that the constant rate of growth is, is moving towards something that makes any sense, you know? I'm not sure, but, you know, some of them are capable of going to church. But the, those that are not, they have to stay in. And it's really sad, you know? Once a senior is evicted, there is almost no hope. Because when they are evicted, you have to pay your rent, security, and you have to have money to move you. And so, they end up being homeless all the time. See, so many of my girlfriends and things are dead now, do. I don't even have anybody to talk to at night, uh, in the evenings, whatnot, like that. I sold my car, I had to sell my car since I've been in here. All of that. Mm -hmm. And all those people are gone, that generation is gone now. Mm -hmm. So I'm one of those generations, I'll probably be gone soon. I had read a lot of books about uh, big cities, about the inner city, about division between the rich and the poor, division between black and white, and walking to Washington, D.C., and it broke my heart apart. You can't really know what poverty and uh, separation verging on segregation uh, looks like until you are in the midst of it. I came here to go to graduate school. Um, I had had kind of a rough time. I was a good student, but my parents considered me to be something of a, a lost child in a way, like, you know, when is Mark going to figure out what he's doing? So they were very excited when I seemed to be, like, on this trajectory towards some sort of prestigious job at this, you know, fancy school in the East, because I'm from rural Montana, that's, that's my background. Uh, then when I walked away from that, essentially, having spent tens of thousands of dollars to uh, work at a radical bookstore, I think it's fair to say there was, uh, um, there was a little bit of concern. I, I didn't want to hurt my parents. I didn't want to let them down. And I knew that I had been given a great opportunity um, but I couldn't do what I was being taught um, to do. So I had to find something I could do. When you think of gentrification, you have to think of uh, how did neighborhoods get run down? You know, it, was, it, it wasn't about accident. Uh, and the role that the city, uh, the government, uh, played in running down neighborhoods. The role of government is to create access and opportunity, particularly for those at the low end. Why? Because it brings in the mix that humans need. What has happened in the District of Columbia over the, the, the last few decades is that there has been a, an, an intentional <laughs> um, abandonment of the people who live in the neighborhoods. We're one of those pockets that's been left hanging, you know, we are the, the hanging fruit. The city cannot survive Not with yet. only high end dwellers. Some people think it's great because it's pretty, it's clean, the buildings look nice. 
but it's not community. It's not human at all. Today we're here for this heritage trail to be kicked off and it talks about all the glorious history here in this neighborhood of the way people, African American people, work together in the face of incredible odds. We have to learn to to understand and appreciate differences. That's the largest issue here. The housing situation is just playing out the fact that we don't. The danger is that the only place that the long-term low-income residents will appear is on signs of, of history. <laughs> And, and that's why it's so important to empower uh, uh, residents with the knowledge of their rights and uh, bring allies to the struggle to make sure that if they've been here through the hard times, they don't get kicked out and driven away when suddenly times get better. Hello, this is Mark. Yeah, hey, Miss Steven. Six, seven, you get all this down. Nine. You get all this down. I just gave you tomato. Are you good? All right. Can I give you a vegetable? I'm not sure. Uh, no. Just fruit. Okay. All right. All right. Um, well, I got started with uh, We Are Family. Actually, um, this. I think it was September. No, it must have been October. I found out about Mark Anderson actually through my research because one of the chapters of my dissertation is going to deal explicitly with Mark Anderson. Why do we focus on seniors? For me, it's because without seniors, there is no larger community. It gives us a chance to um, try to spread the word about different things happening in the community, especially with all the development going on, that's really, really important. Any way we can reach out um, and try to make sure people know they're not alone and that there are folks who will stand with them uh, defending their rights. Do you have a good idea? Maybe? Oh. <laughs> Does this look like a democracy? <laughs> I'm a student in Canada. Um, and I got in an exchange program back there where I could actually come to the US to study for the year. By being here in DC, I came across Positive Force, and through Positive Force, I found We Are Family. Well, I was starting to write a book which later became Dance of Days, two decades of punk in the nation's capital. My immersion in the DC punk underground um, was the center of my life. Punk rock is not what you buy, it's not what you get in a club, or it's not a kind of clothes, or it's not a kind of, even a kind of music, really. It's just an area where ideas, new ideas, can present you outside of commerce. That's the very first stencil, a Riot girl stencil, ever done, um, and they gave it to us. Dialogue is crucial in your space, helps us to do just this, talk together. I thought, well, there's this little notice for this organization that works with seniors, in you know the inner city, I'll work part time there, and I'll write this book, and um, we'll keep it very simple. You know, I mean, I've never stopped the work since then. Um, it just grabbed a hold of my heart um, because all of a sudden I began to immerse myself and be immersed in what I would consider the real Washington D.C. This the city past the monuments, the the, the largely African American community which has been born out of incredible struggle and strife um, and then in the face of overwhelming odds has persisted and grown. On one hand I was working you know with this kind of uh, rebellious outsider youth counterculture punk rock underground and I'm working with these senior citizens many of whom were profoundly religious, um, you know, uh, living uh, lives that started in the country and then came to the city a million miles from what this punk rock thing would look like. All of a sudden it seemed to me that the many of the values that, that I aspire to in, in punk were actually mirrored in the seniors. I 
kind of opened the door to my friends in that community to come in and get to know my friends in the Shaw and North Capitol Street communities. My question is, um, what do you say to today's young people to, so that they can continue to be inspired to be a part of the movement or to be activists, to be organizers? Because the, the mainstream media is always telling young people, um, you all are too young, you don't have enough experience, you're too unfocused, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. I would say to young people this, I would say study slavery, Study Mississippi, and you will come to realize that ordinary people can be anything. If you don't, haven't gotten one of these yet, please do. <laughs> it's a listing of all the activities we've got going on this weekend. Particularly, we have a concert tomorrow night that is a benefit for a couple of wonderful groups working for affordable housing. I'm feeling a little bashed now because I work for one of them. <laughs> Traditionally, music is something that kids have always responded to, and it seems like in any movement there's usually been a soundtrack or music that's kind of gone hand in hand with what's going on. By building a community like through music, even if it's not like music with, I don't know, political agendas or anything like that, just getting people together and stoked about something and then like, you know, letting them know other things that you care about and if they care about your music. When basically, you know, the music scene was having such a huge effect on my life, because I was also, you know, that age 20, more than 20 years ago, but, but where, I mean, that's when you want to really, to hope to affect people when they're 18, to make them really think about what it is they're about to do. What are they going to do with their life? There's so many people who, you know, who said coming to see um, Fugazi play or earlier shows in um, the DC hardcore scene or whatever, the effect that it had on their life, you know, it really applied to whatever they ended up doing. A lot of Mark's um, source for, for volunteers is, is through the punk, you know, punk activists. At nine o'clock, we get up and we go visit the seniors. We either give them groceries or just go over and talk to them, see how they're doing. A lot of our lyrics that Mona writes are about uh, where her grandmother had Alzheimer's and they didn't have a lot of money and kind of watching her succumb to that. Yeah, but I'm really interested in this whole like senior citizens, especially underprivileged with not a lot of family who are living in these wherever that don't have resources and I mean the depression and the loneliness that happens like it's just completely unnecessary completely unnecessary yeah. and we used to go uh, we, we used to visit Mona's Nana a, a lot twice a week actually a lot of the women that were in the same home with her knew Mona when she was a little kid so we kind of you know sing spread the love yeah so we'd, we'd end up there for a while, and um, it, you know, it's hard to leave, but it's also you know, hard to be there I mean, the conditions. So uh, yeah, the song Love is Ageless, we were driving past a nursing home in Cambridge, uh, and it has a big uh, billboard, a banner outside, and it says, Love is Ageless, come visit us. And we were like, and there's all these old ladies sitting there. And it's just, you know, kind of killed me. Yeah. You have actually done you know, uh, We Are Family outing. Yeah. Did you get to meet some seniors? Yeah, I did. I played pool with a couple of them and brought some of them groceries. <laughs> yeah. It was really awesome. It was so awesome. You cannot walk down the hill to catch the bus, get on the bus, ride to the store, come, drive the grocery home. You can't do it. Mm-hmm. Not as a senior, because mm -hmm. you can't lift. It's just kind of an unexpected thing, kind of just happened. I guess that's sometimes the most beautiful stuff that you never expect, and then it just kind of comes to be. So, 
Anyway, we have made ourselves about 80 bags and we are going to deliver them to about 80 different seniors. I've always been kind of into the music scene and, and I guess it was just the next step. And when you see these people in the state that they're in and some of them are still so positive and just really, really happy about life, I mean, it just you feel responsible to, to, to help them out. Most of these folks are living at or below the poverty line, um, which is a terrible place to be. You know, most of these folks have worked their whole lives. We want to ask some basic questions about why it is, why we don't take care of our elders better. Why don't we take care of uh, uh, low-income people in general uh, better in this country, you know, the richest, most powerful country in the history of the world. Yeah. No, it was the, probably the first one. So it was the first one. <laughs> you didn't film that part, right? <laughs> We are a family, we've got a grocery delivery for you. All right, all right, come on in. How's it going? Well, oh, it's doing okay. Everybody can come in. Great, thank you. <laughs> Tall and I'm short. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm still living, as, as they say in the land of the living. <laughs> Try to tell people to look past the hair and all these other things. And where I was living before I moved this last time, on Saturday, a lot of the punk punkers would deliver the food, and when they come in with their, you know, purple hair and all this, somebody would say, "Oh, those are the kids come to see Lucy." <laughs> <laughs> and I said, "Yeah, they are my kids. Come on in." <laughs> <laughs> and then once the people talk with them and. Then they'd be asking me, when are those kids coming back? Well, the way it works in Canada, at least in my own experience there, we don't have communities that are segregated the way they are out here. We don't have African-American communities, or at least the ones that I've, I've never been introduced to that idea until I came to D.C. So the whole idea of being in an African-American community itself freaked me out because I didn't know what that meant or, or how we'd be accepted, especially because my hair kind of makes me stand out a little bit and people don't always appreciate me when they just look at me on the surface. So to be meeting up with some of the seniors at first, I didn't know if they would just kind of reject me or if they would be cool about, you know, interacting. And mm -hmm. I think the most common reaction is at first they're like, what color is your hair? <laughs> you know, are you dyeing your hair? What are you doing to your hair? And that's the most common reaction. But then after a few interactions, they're like, oh, there's my baby, there's my beautiful. They start petting, like, I guess it just kind of grows on them. Yeah. That stuff is not running in your hair. No, I feel how soft it is. I know. <laughs> I know. You can't be ruined that it doesn't look pretty. No, but it looks pretty. Um, I kind of got to a place in my life where I was like getting a little low on inspiration from other people and from my surroundings. And I felt like I needed new friends. And uh, I started volunteering. They've been through so much and they don't complain. I have I have 85 year old black women in my cell phone now in my phone book and they call me sometimes. <laughs> and and um, there's times when only talking to Alma Williams will do. And uh, so when you ask, like, well, how do we reach out to other communities? Like, the only thing I can say is that all I know is that I honestly I was kind of the one who needed to be reached out to. Um, and maybe maybe if we look at it that way, it would go a little different. Um, this next song is about this, this one woman in particular, Alma Williams. And so this is going to be a little tough. This is called The East Side of the River. I'm sure you've all heard about Miss Williams. Everybody loves her because she's just the chattiest person. And uh, when she found out I did history, I mean, she was just happy to talk to me about, like, you know. She, she told me she misses Jimmy Carter, which I thought was really funny. And oh, well, today we're going to see Ms. Williams, and she's awesome. Ms. Williams? Hello? 
first time and she's like the happiest lady I've ever met in my life and it was just you meet these people and it's like mom bring everybody to me <laughs> everybody you get on the phone and call Miss yeah. William yeah. I'm 84 <laughs> I can't get over it no way <laughs> see? <laughs> see? <laughs> see I meant to tell you <laughs> travels is something else ain't it I like travel that Travis is a devil, you know? I thought, I said, let me get on the phone and call Travis. He probably looked on his phone and saw I, I had called. And I, um, you can leave a message, Miss Williams. Alma Williams, Alma Williams is way more fun than 99% of my friends. She's oh, yeah. funnier, she's looser. Yeah. Uh, she says much more like shocking off-color things, you know? <laughs> you weren't even born when I came to Washington. I came to Washington in 39. The first oh, wow. of all, the Lincoln Theater, and then they had the dance hall up on U Street, the Lincoln Colonnade, all of that, all of that. I take your history all the way back. The history that we're losing every day. Unfortunately, every senior that passes takes with them memories that haven't been shared and that we'll never be able to recapture. I just can't get up and about like I used to, that's all. But the, And I'm not going to say that. God forgive me for saying that. Because I know you, you you handle it all. When you get ready for me to get up and do and whatnot, I will go. Praise the Lord. When, my, when I did my first visit, uh, Miss Simmons was on my route, and she was actually one of the first black people in Congress. This is my senator I came here with, came to Washington with. Mm -hmm. There I am right there. This is my senator I came to Washington with. Right there. Thomas C. Hennings, Jr. Uh -huh. uh, he told me, Zelma. I did, that's not my name, my name is Belva. <laughs> Belma, I want you to go up there and pass that civil rights bill. Says so United States Senate staff. Yes, sir. The first one. Wow. That was the very first one. Mm -hmm. So you were the first, um, yeah. you were the first black person that's first staff, and woman too. That's quite amazing. <laughs> that's quite amazing. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> Yep, yep, yep. Wow. Mm -hmm. Wasn't that something? Yeah. That, that was amazing. really something, yes. Yeah. How did you get um how did you get in hooked up with Mark and his group? How did you guys Being poor and needy? No. <laughs> <laughs> other seniors we visit have uh, family members that also are around taking care of them, but you know, Belva's special because she, she doesn't really have any other family members or anything else, so we kind of, we fill that gap for her and are her family, and um, I think it's kind of a shock to me to find kind of this national treasure of, of living history right here. It's a great, it's an incredible organization to, you know, to be able to work for and to I mean, it, it really is the kind of thing I think that's going to have to pick up where so much of our inability, basically, to govern ourselves is. Or maybe this is our ability to govern ourselves. I mean, this is how you do it. You just kind of take it, you know, by community or by state or by whatever. And you, and you create the organization that can provide for, you know, the whole. Yeah. Yeah, he's my friend. When they don't come around, I'm in trouble. <laughs> I'm in trouble, yes indeed. Not only do I get to meet incredible people, but I get a really, the real sense, you know, at the end of every We Are Family um, visit that I really did something good today, so. You see that you make a difference? It's not just the theoretical, well, you know, we're just visiting these people. We're actually, I think they actually are happy to see us and it means a lot to them to have that interaction. Beyond all the other, you know, stuff we might aspire to, for a senior who is sitting essentially imprisoned in his or her own home uh, with family that feels at least so far away, for a couple unfamiliar but friendly faces to come and knock on 
their door and appear That's the biggest, biggest, most beautiful statement that they actually matter, that anyone could ever give. And believe me, um, it will matter to them. Every day, supposed to be a 